Hey, C. Suretsky here, as always, Canadian Real Estate Market Update with a particular focus on Vancouver. If you're getting sort of value or entertainment out of these videos, all I ask you hit thumbs up and subscribe. Questions, comments, put those below. Uh, I want to touch this week on, you know, an update on the Vancouver housing market for sort of the, you know, long time listeners for, you know, that come here for the Vancouver specific content. But, you know, first and foremost, I want to frame it up um, because I think, yeah, again, you have to sort of, when you're looking at the, the, the micro, you have to understand the macro first and foremost. Because that kind of, you know, obviously uh, helps you create a framework for understanding things. So, you know, first and foremost, I, I put put out this tweet um, where, you know, <laughs> I basically said that assets drive the economy, you know, not the other way around. And basically, we're now in this new era where, um, you know, policymakers and particularly our central bankers are you know doing these QE programs essentially you know these money printing programs as you want to call them you know the zero interest rate policy it's all designed to stimulate and boost asset prices right so the whole mantra is listen we, if we stimulate asset prices if we lower the interest rates and force savers into these more risky or speculative investments um, this will push asset prices higher. This will then create a wealth effect. You know, higher, higher stock prices and higher real estate prices creates new, you know, equity at least on paper, and allows you to then, you know, leverage that equity and and go buy a boat or buy a car, or you just feel better, right? It's like that old that old uh, you know saying from Warren Buffett, right? I mean, the guy says, you know, he goes goes through the McDonald's drive-through every single day and buys you know, a, a cheeseburger and, and, and a Coke. And he says, you know, when the markets are down, he doesn't buy the fries, but if the markets are up, he buys the fries, right? So it's like, th that's kind of just the way of thinking. And, and that's how these, you know, these policymakers, these central bankers think, right? If we can just boost the asset prices, uh, you know, people will spend more and that will eventually trickle down to sort of all the plebes. Um, but, so, you know, when we look at what happened during the pandemic, right, all you have now is every single central bank, you know, doing these massive QE programs, flooding the system with liquidity. And lo and behold, right, it's not just like Canadian real estate. It's like, you know, we've got global property markets. So if we look at, uh, you know, a recent report from the OECD, um, you know, the economics department there, you know, they put out a, a, a report that of the, so they, you know, they put this index out, which basically tracks global home prices uh, of the 40 countries that it covers. Uh, of the 40, 37 out of 40 uh, saw real home price appreciation in the first quarter of this year. It's the, the largest percentage uh, they've ever seen since they began recording this in, uh, in the year 2000. Um, and same thing now we've got, so global property prices are up, you know, uh, as per their metric, you know, 9%. This is the fastest pace of home price acceleration, uh, again, that they've seen on record going back to, uh, when they began tracking this data in the 2000s. So what you have is basically this, again, a sea of liquidity. Every single asset is going up. Again, I prefer to look at it as more of a currency devaluation it's a loss of purchasing power that again maybe it shows up in cpi basket maybe it doesn't but ultimately it shows up in, in assets you ha essentially you have too much money you have too much liquidity in the system that is all seeking out a finite number of assets and that's kind of where we're at so um and you know this this whole notion now. So we know obviously you know getting around to to Canada here. You know Vancouver property prices, Toronto property prices, national home prices in Canada, you know growing at the fastest pace we've ever seen. Um, you know you see all these reports coming out, and uh, you know one of the common headlines I see here in Vancouver and Toronto specifically is it goes. Oh, it now takes the average person, the average income earner, thirty years. They you know they have to save for thirty years before they can. Uh, afford a, a down payment on, on a home and I'm like again it's all about like how you look at things understand them like okay first and foremost I can tell you with 100% certainty I've never worked I, I don't think I've worked with a client that actually saves money and then buys a property like generally speaking like you yes okay you save money to invest it so you have it invested in stocks 
And then, you know, as those stocks obviously go up, you then ultimately, and a lot of them end up draining some of that, you know, new created wealth as the down payment. Or we see, uh, you know, massive gifting of, of, so for the first time home buyers that I work with in Vancouver, I, I, I don't know of anyone yet that I have worked with and I've worked with a lot of clients. I haven't worked with any first time home buyers yet that have actually come in and accumulated their own down payment. Everyone I know has had some help from family and friends, whether that's a, lo a temporary loan or just an outright gift. So what you have now is this like, sort of new world economy where, again, you don't save money for a, a down payment from a house. If you're getting you know, 0.5% in your checking or in your savings account at the bank and inflation's running at 3%, you're an idiot. You don't save there for 30 years. It's gonna take you, you know, it's not gonna take you 30 years, it's gonna take you 100 years because every single year you're losing purchasing power. Um, so nobody saves anymore. You can't save because policymakers have eliminated that ability to save. They have, de they have decimated the saver. So you invest. So what I am seeing in the housing market is this wealth transfer, right? People are, people are just simply, all they're doing is leveraging and trading existing assets. So they could be trading existing stocks. Uh, they could have a condo that they then trade up or leverage that up into buying a house. Or again, the parents who have, cr who have amassed this, you know, 30 years of rising home prices, they've amassed this, this equity uh, in their home, they're leveraging that and gifting it down to their kids. And again, I understand, don't get me wrong, this is, has perverse consequences of these wealth inequalities where, hey, if your parents aren't well off, that uphill battle for you is going to be that much more difficult. Uh, and so it really is creating this this environment, this this era of the haves versus the have-nots, right? If you're, if you're born in sort of, you know, the, the so-called lucky sperm club and, and you get gifted you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a down payment, like you push that much further up you know, compared to the rest of society. And so again, th this is, and central banks have acknowledged this phenomenon, but I don't think there, there's any willingness to actually suddenly have a change of heart and, and, and change the direction that they're going. So they are blowing these massive inequality bubbles. Um, but you know that that's just the environment that we're in today. So you have to kind of learn to, and adapt. So I, you know, I laugh at all these these PhD economists that come out and say it takes thirty years to save, dude. Nobody saves anymore. Um, anyway, so not to bore you to death with that, but that kind of brings me full circle here into Vancouver. Obviously, you know, your your typical average, you know, detached house now, as per the MLS benchmark, sits at one point eight million dollars. Obviously, an egregious number. Uh, and and you don't get there by saving for that down payment. Most people that are buying these houses are leveraging existing equity and assets. Um, but you know, as as we can see, as we get into the sort of micro of this Vancouver housing market, uh, as I've talked about in these videos before, we're now starting to see it in the data. I've been talking about this for several months now. Uh, you're seeing that the housing market ultimately, uh, at least right now for this cycle, looks like it peaked in March. That was kind of your, your, you know, your record home sales. We continue to decelerate from there. Um, so you got the foam that's pulled out of the market. I mean, for the first month, um, we we did not see a year over year, or sorry, a month over month increase in the MLS benchmark. So prices, price growth is essentially stuck right now at fourteen percent on a year over year basis. Um, however, the problem is is that you have new listings that are also non-existent. So as I've alluded to before, and I, I appreciate all the ridicule on here saying, hey, this guy's an idiot, doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, I alluded to this reopening trade many months ago that you know the housing boom was simply driven by human emotions. Obviously, a sea of liquidity certainly helps drive those purchases. Um, and now what you're seeing is people get vaccinated and the economy reopens. Everybody's on vacation. Everyone's out of here. This is the summer. Um, you know, half the realtors in my office are on vacation. So there's no listings happening. So if you actually look at the number of new listings, for example, um, you know, let's look at the, the detached housing market. The number of new listings for, for single family detached houses dropped to the lowest levels in over 20 years in the month of July. So it's an incredibly, I mean, it's hard, it's hard now 
when you have a situation where new listings, you already have low inventory. Yes, the sales have dropped off, so buyer demand has arguably dropped off, but you've got a situation where new listings also aren't coming to market. So now we've got inventory levels at their lowest levels uh, in over 15 years. So you've got the lowest inventory levels in over 15 years as of the end of July. Pretty hard, pretty hard, could be wrong, but pretty hard to see uh, a sustained decline in home prices if you've got the lowest inventory levels in 15 years. It just, it just won't happen. Um, now, again, what's gonna matter here is, is August is another write-off. You go into September, October, you're gonna restart the normal real estate uh, seasonal activity. But you're gonna you're gonna be starting again at a, a very low, extremely low base in terms of the overall inventory level. So this is going to take months and months and months just to restock the the cabinets, so to speak. They've been plucked dry, so you got to restock those cabinets, uh, and that's going to take a lot of time. So I think that's kind of what what's important. What's happening? I actually think that the condo market is going to outperform the single family and townhouse markets over the next 12 months. In Vancouver here, we tend to see a, a market that ebbs and flows. So the detached market usually goes up, uh, it gets too crazy, the condo market eventually starts to follow on a lag, and that's as the detached market slows down. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the data, right? If you look at you know sales to actives ratios, the increase in sales. So in the condo market, for example, you had um, not only it, not a, not an, you had an actual increase in sales, not like the townhouse and detached market, you had a decrease in sales, you had an increase in condo sales and a decline uh, in new listings. So it's kind of going a little bit in the opposite direction. Again, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but that's kind of something I'm paying attention to. Now again, you know, not all markets are one and the same. If I look at the, the, the best sort of value buy today, um, you know, so I get this question a lot, hey, what should I buy, what should I buy? You know, we look at the, the overall market. The overall market as a whole in Greater Vancouver, as we just mentioned, is up 14% year over year. Now, we know that, you know, suburban single family houses are up 30. We know suburban townhouses are up 25. You know, if you look at condos downtown, I mean, they're still flat to down. I mean, two bedroom condos are actually down, you know, 6% on a year over year basis. So, you know, compare a two bedroom condo in downtown Vancouver that's down, down 6% versus a single family house out in the suburbs that's up 30, uh, you can clearly see that there's sort of a mismatch here. I would argue that one's probably an opportunity and one you're cherry picking the top. So uh, that's kind of my thoughts, but uh, as always, we'll, we'll kind of continue to watch this market um, you know, on a, on a monthly basis. Obviously we have, we've got my uh, you know, regular Yahoo interviews with, with myself and John Pasalis there in Toronto. So if you're looking for that sort of Toronto uh, take on it, uh, I always encourage you to tune into those shows, which will ultimately get posted here on this channel. Um, but in terms of the overall framework, uh, nothing has changed there. Uh, I don't look at this as a, you know, a pump and, pump and dump promotionary uh, series of videos uh, on housing, I, I'm really just trying to emphasize that, you know, regardless of your view on housing, I think things are, obviously we know that they're extremely crazy here. I continue to look at this um, as a failure. I really feel it's like the early stages almost of like a currency that's again, failing that you can clearly see um, you know, purchasing powers are just being eroded and that this is all showing up in massive asset price inflation. 